good evening to all who have joined in the today webinar on blockchain the new technology of trust and future prospects respected issues person on today's occasion dr a damodaran sir professor in economics and social science indian institute of management i am bangalore respected senior members past chairman of iirc and chapter rcm ccm esteemed members invitees guests and all learned participants chairman of the chapter cm himaj misra secretary of the chapter and cm sn tripathi and all other professional colleagues in the managing committee of bhubaneswar chapter icm sakthidhar singh chairman pd committee warmly welcomes you all to the today's webinar and pray before lord jagannath for all of yours and beloved ones in good health before introducing our today's research person i would like to request our official to play the institute anthem as a mark of inauguration in the virtual mode Thank you. Now I feel proud, privileged to give brief introduction of our today's research person. <coughs> Professor Dr. A. Damodaran Sir did his doctoral studies. in economics and has held academic and professional assignments abroad including visiting faculty position in various institutions he was an environmental fellow with us environmental protection agency and a visiting scholar at the university of california at berkeley under the us asia environment program in 1994 he has also held visiting faculty position in the university of bonn germany Institute of Developing Economics Japan University of Wageningen Netherlands and the Graduate School of Management St Petersburg State University in Russia in 2012 he was appointed visiting fellow at the United Nations University Institute of Advanced Study Japan as a scholar in residence at the University of North California USA in 2015 He worked on the convergence of environmental economics and cultural economics. Apart from his work of environmental climate financing, Damodaran Sir led the initiative on biodiversity financing for the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity. Since 2015, he has been the chairperson of the Government of India Technical Advisory Committee of Biofin India. He has also been involved with analysis of economics of distributed network technology, cryptocurrency and crypto tokens generated through blockchains, and IoT-based platform, and has written on these topics and provided industry-level inputs. He was part of India's delegation to CBD to negotiate biodiversity financing issues in COP11. At present, he is professor in economics and social science, Indian Institute of. I am Bangalore. 
थैंक यू सर फॉर एक्सेप्टेंस ऑफ आवर इनविटेशन एंड वेलकम यू सर डियर प्रोफेशनल फ्रेंड्स द टूडे टॉपिक इज ए न्यू कॉन्सेप्ट एंड वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग फॉर ऑल ऑफ आस विच नो डाउट आर वेल्यू टू आवर प्रोफेशनल करियर होप दिस सेशन विल बी very much educative and learning session for all of us let's listen from our learning resource person dr damodaran sir <clears throat> now i would like to request our chairman sim himaj mishra to address thank you sir namaste 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 very good evening to one and all present in today's webinar on blockchain the new technology of trust and future prospect respected resource person on the occasion dr a damodaran sir central council member of our institute same niranjan misra sir same sakthidhar singh sir chairman pd same surjan narayan tripathi sir secretary of this chapter professional colleagues in the management committee esteemed member invitee and guest i on behalf of the management committee of icai bhuvneswar chapter welcome you all to today's webinar in virtual mode i also convey special thanks and profound gratitude to dr a damodaran sir for accepting our invitation and sparing his valuable time even in sunday thank you sir special okay. thanks to our chairman pd committee cms saktidhar singh sir he is the person behind the entire program for selecting such a new thought for our members for information of dr a damodaran sir i feel privileged to highlight in abstract about our premier institute and vibrant chapter bhuvneswar chapter the institute of cost accountant of india is a statutory body established under the act of parliament in the year 1959 for regulation of the profession of cost and management accountancy in india the institute functions directly under the administrative control of ministry of corporate affairs government of india to discharge its responsibility in effective manner it is the largest management accounting body in asia and second largest management accounting body in globe it has contributed substantially for the growth of industrial and economic climate of this country the main mission of the institute is to drive the enterprise globally by creating value of the stakeholders in the socio economic context through competency drawn from the integration of strategy management and accounting its headquarters situated at kolkata four regional council offices 114 chapters three center of excellence spread all over india and nine overseas centers there are more than 80000 cost and management accountants both in employment and practice and about 6 lakh students pursuing this cma course the icai bhuvneswar chapter is one of the vibrant and best chapter among 114 chapters in india on an average around 1500 students are taking education at this chapter for cost and management accountancy course per year we have around 700 qualified cma members who are in service and practice this chapter has received best chapter award consecutively 22nd time in the eastern region and only one chapter in pan india who has received the brand building award from our nobel institute besides seminar on various contemporary topic for its members and students this chapter also regularly conducts yoga health awareness program blood donation camp traffic awareness programs plantation swachh bharat investor awareness program motivational session international women's day and many more 
for the benefits of members, students, and its stakeholders. Without taking more time, I would like to request Shakti sir to continue thanking you all. Wish you a happy holy in advance. Jai Jagannath. Namaskar. Thank you, CME Imaj Mr. Chairman of the chapter. Now, I would like to request uh, Professor Dr. A. Damodaran sir uh, to start the session, sir. Thank okay. you. Uh, thank you so much. I, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So you can see on the screen what I wanted to present. And uh, can you see the screen? Yes, sir. Okay. Now I have to speak on blockchains and what its impacts are and how it is useful for people. And what is so, what are the negative parts of, negative aspects of blockchain also? I'm not just saying, talking about the positive things, but also the negative things. But the negatives are far less compared to the positive things. That is my simple point. Now the question is, this is exactly what uh, blockchain is trying to solve. You know, this gentleman is sitting and watching, is very carefully going through a yellow sheet of, uh, you know, his accounts book. Actually, he's a moneylender's clerk. He is sitting and making entries. And he's watching entries and he's trying to make entries, right? Sometimes we know from our uh, old uh, stories uh, that these uh, people are not liked by farmers and peasants and others. Because what they do is they, they give a loan and then after that they have ways of, you know, controlling the person for his whole life. So blockchain basically is a, what this man is showing at us on the screen that you see, this yellow book, okay? It is a yellow book, but you can see this yellow book called blockchain because it is digital, okay? So what is this yellow book? Yellow book is a book of accounts. And you people know better. Uh, I don't have to tell you what accounts is. You, you can teach me, all of you can teach me a little bit on what accounts is. I don't have to uh, say anything about accounts. So, one reason why I accepted uh, to come and talk to you is that for cost accountants as well as chartered accountants, blockchain is supposed to be the next best thing. It is very close to your uh, profession. And it is very important that you embrace this profession because you are not going to deal with annual reports of companies which you audit, right? Or keep accounts of. We, uh, you are no longer uh, just going to do it. You are also going to handle digital ledgers. Digital ledgers are basically, essentially, digital accounts books. So what is happening is, in this case, this gentleman, what he does is, he not only enters accounts, but he also manipulates the accounts. So some people are honest, some people are not very honest about it. So if you go to a rural money lender, his accountant will typically make one entry when the person is borrowing money, and later on, uh, she can basically, he can basically change the entry and say, oh, you borrowed, uh, you borrowed 2,000 rupees, not 1,000 rupees. We gave you 800 rupees, not, um, not 600, as you claim. So this is something which blockchain tries to solve. Blockchain's digital ledger is not like this one. It cannot be tampered with. You cannot make entries and re-entries and wrap it off and write something new. You have to always keep a digital entry and that digital entry is kept forever. You cannot change it. So in that sense, blockchains are digital ledgers based on, which are secure, immutable. Secure means you cannot, uh, it cannot be tampered with. Immutable because once you make an entry, you cannot change it. Overwriting, underwriting, nothing is possible. And therefore it is not, cannot be manipulated or rewritten. So that is the big difference that blockchain makes to your lives. And then this is a technical thing. Uh, it is called blockchain are digital ledgers based on distributed networks. Now what is a distributed network? A distributed network is what? That is exactly what I'll be trying to explain. This is a technical term not very important for uh, people who want to apply blockchains, but still I'll explain it. it, needs an explanation. So let me take you through a technical. Now here you can see 
this is one there is a small spoke a hub this is called a hub a central point and these are the spokes spoke means projections right this is a typical way by which bank financial institutions airlines airlines you know uh, uh, indian Air, air india etc etc uh, air france all of the banking and financial institutions for instance the banking institution will be based on reserve bank of india with countless number of uh, banks uh, which are reporting to it and all these are examples of what is called a centralized uh, distribute a centralized network now this has been always considered to be a very efficient system because you have a hub and the hub is centralizing all the information right and because of that you have one person coordinating everything and therefore in one point you are able to get all the information that is happening for all these folks and imagine that these are banks and this is a central bank or a bank so this is exactly the system which is working now this system has been working very well now and uh, people used to think that this is very foolproof this is very efficient now look at the airlines airlines is another uh, uh, india air india air india will always uh, have its international flights but all flights will start from delhi or mumbai from india and go to different places so somebody has taken air india and gone to paris and that person wants to go to new york so it, it is uh, basically not uh, so simple that you know you uh, basically a flight of air india from uh, from uh, paris to new york directly air india will not fly either it will charter some flight with lufthansa or somebody but most of the time it will say okay i have another flight starting from delhi which goes to new york flight so why do you want to uh, so you can come down to delhi and uh, another flight to do that. or you can take some other airline which has got a direct connection now this is the problem with the hub and spoke model that you know everything is centralized on this particular point and if this particular point gets compromised then the entire edifice the entire system gets uh gets to be compromised if there is a imagine that in the central point there's a cyber attack then it is then all these points will get compromised it will be completely finished so as against it, the centralized network people have discovered that in the era of information technology this is not just very a good great idea so they have been they explore decentralized network which is basically network means too many points which are uh, which are logged in a relationship that is uh, what is called as a network in decentralized network what happens is the same thing becomes like this. the picture becomes like this in this picture what happens is this is state bank of india this is union bank of india this is bank of baroda or whatever banks are existing these are different banks and each bank the bank has got a central central office and its uh, regional offices and branches are all the details are coming from these offices similarly union bank of india similarly other bank of baroda all these offices are big so what happens is this is a much better system because there is nothing like a central bank after that all the operations are between the head offices of different banks and that is how the whole system works now in this system there is no one central point there are multiple central points 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 seven central uh, seven points so you have to if somebody wants to uh, fill for the data or she has to and get the entire system data with them in that case they will have to basically hack into multiple points or multiple points have to be compromised before the entire thing keeps coming down but here just if you attack, if you are able to focus on one point that thing can be compromised so this is decentralized system now this was also not good enough uh, and uh, it was uh, you know the banking system has gone into a decentralized mode on day to day operations the reserve bank of india comes only for interbank uh, transfers and all that and the interbank reserves keeping interbank reserves but the decentralized network was supposed to be much better than this one because 
things where transactions between banks were quicker, simpler, and better. But this also had a problem. The problem was that, for instance, here, State Bank of India head office, all transactions will have to come from State Bank of India to their, their head office. And from their head office, it will go to the Central Bank of India head, head office. Then a Central Bank of India head office will send it to a particular branch. So I am sitting here. I am sitting in Bangalore, in a particular place in Bangalore, say empty room. And I want to transact with Central Bank in Bhuvaneshwar. In the decentralized system, I my uh, transact means I want to send 500 rupees to my friend here who is an accountant in the bank. So it comes to it has to come to State Bank of India head office, I mean, in Mumbai or someplace, and then or maybe in Bangalore also regional office, and then from that regional office it will go to uh, eastern area, maybe in Kolkata or maybe in Bhuvaneshwar. But by the time it reaches a specific port uh, branch in Bhuvaneshwar, it takes a lot of time and it is less efficient because you are you spend quite a lot of anxious moments. Whether that 500 rupees did reach, then I will be ringing up my friend, did have, have you checked up your accounts? Has that happened? Has the deposit happened? You say, no, even today it has not happened. All of us are facing this problem, right? But the system is definitely better than this one. This is definitely decentralized is better. But blockchain tries to even avoid this problem and get into distributed networks, which means these points are all lost one against the other. Every point is connected to the other point through a circuit. Now, this point is connected to this point through a circuit, which runs like this, runs like this, runs, uh, comes down, comes like this, and joins. But in this system, only through central bank, central uh, office, it things will move. So this is what is called distributed network. So distributed networks means all these points are e can see what transactions are happening between me here, I was sitting in Bangalore, State Bank of India, MG Road, with my friend in Bhuvaneshwar, some particular branch in Bhuvaneshwar. This entire system is aware of the transaction. They may not know who the persons are, but they know that if a particular person with a wallet, uh, yeah, see, it's called wallet to wallet transfer. So my wallet, digital, it's all digital. It's not physical. You can't see the wallet. And from this, my, my wallet to this wallet is gone. But the others are all seeing the transaction and they are seeing whether these wallets are authorized wallets or not. So each wallet has got a number and you can check the number and find out whether it is authorized. Now, this is the method of distributed network. And this is exactly what blockchains are about. They are a letter of accounts on transactions, interpersonal transactions, and each uh, transaction is uh, made available to all the people. Earlier, only the central bank knew about the transactions. Now, every every point, every branch of uh, different branches would be technically aware of these of this thing, and they will see whether and they are required to even verify it is an authentic transaction or not. So if they verify that this authentic transaction, how do they verify authentic transaction? The data they have is 500 rupees, amount transferred. This is wallet number one. It carries a public key. Public key means a, a code. Now, this one, the person receiving it also has a public key, his code, his wallet code. So if the public key is to be done, the public key has to be verified by a group of programmers and they verify it. And once they verify it, not this one person, many verifiers, and 50% of the, more than 50% of the verifiers are saying this is an authentic transaction. The transaction is approved. Now, all this is not done over hours, it is done in a few minutes 10 minutes, 11 minutes at the best. So, this, whereas the other one will take three to four days to do it. So, this is the idea behind uh, uh, blockchains. Now, the transaction typically is this, this is a distributed ledger. So in the distributed ledger, it is almost this is a blockchain. Now, this blockchain will have a block, actually, a block, not a blockchain. Now, this uh, block will is a ledger, it's digital. So you load my transaction to my friend at Donation. Like that, many people will be transacting one from Mumbai to Chennai, another person from Delhi to Bangalore, and so on and so forth. All this is recorded uh, in the, or entered the metadata. Metadata means the basic essential data, not the entire data. But the, only the essential data of the transactions are entered. 
and then uh, it is digitized. And once uh, every transaction is entered, it is updated. The ledger is becomes updated automatically because it is programmed to get automatically updated. So this fellow, the accountant we saw in the first slide, he will uh, uh, he will uh, he will take it and write it in a small piece of paper, and in the evening he will sit and start entering the accounts. In blockchain, you don't have to do it. The moment an account a transaction is done, automatically the ledger entry is made. And that ledger entry is made and it is verified, confirmed as an authentic transaction. And once the transaction is done, the timestamp uh, at which it entered, timestamp means the time at which the blockchain entered, that transaction was entered. Maybe just now I am at 5, 5.40 is the time. So at 5.40, you, you have entered the transaction has to be at 5.40. 500 rupees was transferred from me to my friend. But we don't know who me is. My name is not written, my friend's name is written, but the wallet addresses are given and it is timed there. And then it is sealed. The ledger is, uh, the transaction is cryptographically sealed, which means the code number is given, which is, uh, which is basically arrived at with a lot of calculations on a computer. And once that happens, uh, then you will find uh, the code is arrived with block. Like this, each transaction which enters a block is, uh, is cryptographically uh, uh, protected. And then a series of uh, transactions like this uh, enters the blockchain. And once this transaction enters the blockchain and the capacity of the blockchain ex exceeds 2 MB or 1 MB of data capacity, then the blockchain cannot take further. So the blockchain has to be closed. Now that blockchain is, uh, that closing of the blockchain is done through a hash function. This is a technical thing. And it is such, it is a, such a, it is like a lock. You are putting a lock, but that lock is entirely a code. Now that code is very difficult for any hacker to guess because it is done through complex, uh, this thing. And then it, uh, the whole thing is, uh, works on, the blockchain is closed, it is sealed and linked to the previous letter. Somebody else who has worked on a block and closed it it is linked to the previous one. And then the moment this is closed and linked to the previous one, work on the new block will start. This is how uh, the blockchain system works. So what is the advantage of this uh, ledger? First of all, it is digital. You can't physically tamper with it. It is immutable. You cannot tamper. So if you made a wrong entry, then how do you correct it? You have to go to a new block or a new transaction and correct it there. And in that subsequent ledger or in the same ledger in a different point, you have to correct it. So what is the advantage of this? The advantage is this, that a person can see the entire history. You made a mistake. First, you entered the amount as 400 rupees. Then later on, you corrected it after half an hour and made it 500 and lodged it as a corrected account. And all this is available. Whereas in a conventional account books, you can just rub it off and put a signature saying that it's authentically erased. And all that. that is not possible in a blockchain. So at the end of the day, the blockchain has a very interesting method of getting updated by the second. Every second, the block, block uh, the ledger gets updated. Whereas in conventional ledgers, it takes the accountant has to sit in the evening, tally it, even the electronic uh, electronically enabled or computer enabled uh, digital accounts all take time for the transactions to be entered and secured and verified and all. Here it, it is done immediately because it is automated and programmed that way. So this is how the blockchain system works. Uh, now let me go to uh, so how do companies or government department which want to do blockchain. Now, uh, Niti Aayog is talking about blockchains. State governments are talking about blockchains. Government agencies are talking about blockchains. So how do we, how do we see the importance? In what way do, does an organization or under what circumstances should an organization go for a blockchain? Now, this is a question which has come to me on various occasions. Why is it that people have to go for a blockchain? Okay, we understand it's a digital ledger, it is immutable, it is time-stamped, it is accurate, it is efficient. But why should I, running a company, do this? Because it's a bit complicated and I have to get a technical person who is very good at it. I have to hire that person. And what is it beyond the fact that it sets my entries correct? What else is a economic advantage that my company gets? So 
that's a decision with that's a call which you have to take and that call requires certain criteria so first criteria is all actions need to be automated wherever you want ledgers to be updated every second it is not possible in conventional digital ledgers blockchain is a very advanced digital ledger it is not digital ledger maybe second generation or third generation so the earlier digital ledgers were computerized ledgers everything was in the computer and it is in a database and the second one was decentralized ones where you kept the account books and linked it to a master ledger the third is the blockchain which is the most advanced technology so if you want all your actions to be automated in every entry by the second the entries keep on getting added or the entries get uh, get immediately added to the system to the stream you want that kind of a thing every entry to be done by the second then you need a blockchain so some companies can afford to uh, tally and put and enter uh, data maybe at the end of the day there's no hurry to do it then blockchain is not a solution for you but if every company uh, companies like oil and petro petrochemical companies shipping companies or uh, maybe uh, banking banking industry the banking sector they all want account books to be updated immediately at that spot they don't need accountants and account entry uh, clerical people to sit large number of people you are getting these they can be utilized for other purposes but not for this so they would like blockchains to be a solution but if you think that you know your business you are producing some furniture and that furniture whether you the sales uh, on that furniture is happening there is no hurry for you to do the accounts then blockchain is not going to be a great thing for you still it is a desirable thing but you may think why should i spend that kind of money so that is the first thing the second thing is you don't want any inaccuracy or recorded data to be deleted or modified you don't want you want every the accountant not to play with the data you don't every entry should be once you are entered you should not change it especially financial institutions they cannot afford now look at the number of scams that are happening in uh, various parts of the world including india the latest is the nsc thing uh, before that it was the uh, the nirav modi case on which the courts are still uh, taking action now all these things are because there has been there has been some tampering of accounts some kind of uh, misleading entries and all that now you cannot afford to have this because the entire banking system uh, will be put to uh, or the uh, the financial or the stock exchanges can be put into a big crisis if this happens you cannot afford to. then again you will have to rely on the best thing is to go for a blockchain solution earlier you did not have now you have this option of blockchain third you don't want any intermediaries between participants so for instance insurance companies uh, insurance agents are there right now insurance agents uh, basically they are the ones who make the market so they locate people who need policies and they will match it with insurance companies now under a blockchain system the the entire uh, data of the insurance company is put in the shape of a digital ledger where entries are there etc i mean debits are there everything is there you may not want these uh, agents to sit and facilitate so again blockchains are very useful if you don't want intermediary and then data needs to be exchanged in a very efficient time not taking days and months for a transfer of money from one person to the other but it should be done in about 10 or 15 or 20 minutes then again blockchains are the best thing and finally need to faultlessly guarantee transaction and storage of information you want to see that the transaction has happened and it is settled you want that to happen immediately now india has a fairly very efficient system in uh, clearance and settlement non stock exchanges that is one great thing t plus 2 t plus 1 and all that we have fulfilled it long ago without the blockchain but if a blockchain comes it is automated so automatically we kept uh, the settlement time comes down drastically now what is settlement you know, you, you know it because you are all accountants so settlement is every payment a pay, payment goes with settlement if a payment is made but it is not settled that means that the payment has not reached the intended person 
it it you lose a lot of money you lose a lot of transactions so that is something which uh, if you are not very keen that it should happen then you should go for a blockchain solution so this is the uh, the need for blockchain now the question is why it is this link between blockchains and cryptocurrencies uh, uh, blockchains have to be linked to cryptocurrencies now why is that? first of all let me uh, clarify it so blocks are created one block is packed with transactions up to 1 mb after that it is secured it is closed and it is sealed with a lock lock is a digital code which nobody can break because it is worked out by you through a computer an advanced computer quantum computing system these days it is very complicated to get that thing it is called a hash function now it is part of the hash uh, code and once you do that, once you seal it, you add this blockchain to a string of blockchains which are already created. This a string of blocks which have already been created. So in other words, you chain one block with the other. So the first block was created today. The second block will be created tomorrow. The third block will be created day after tomorrow. All will be put on a chain. They are linked together. That is why it is called blockchain. Now, as I told you, the block is closed. Every transaction is verified, confirmed, and then closed and sealed. The block itself is sealed, which contains all these transactions is sealed. So what happens is, under such circumstances, immutability, you can't play around with numbers because it is sealed, you can't break it. And if you try, somebody tries to tamper it, the problem is the chain impact is such that he or she will have to tamper every ledger every ledger which existed beyond it. You can say, okay, for this company, this ledger is there, let me tamper it. Because it is chained to the other, immediately the siren goes, the signal, uh, the emergency siren goes. Uh, and saying that somebody is tampering with it. So, so many people are watching. It is not just two accountants in the centralized network system. Hardly two fellows will be knowing what is happening. If they are corrupt, then everything is compromised. Here, so many people are working. And therefore, nobody controls the system. Because if there are too many people in that. So that is the assumption. So the code is cryptographically protected. Similarly, there is a, a currency which comes out of a blockchain. I'll tell you why it has to come out. That is also called cryptocurrency. Why is it called cryptocurrency? Because it is protected as a crypto code with a pro, pro, uh, crypto code. What is this crypto code? A mysterious digital uh, number, which has... It is alphanumeric, which means it will have A, B, and alphabets as well as numbers. And that is all right. That's a total secret, which is with you, with the person who has created it. Now, that has its problems, because if you lose that number, then you, had it. you don't get it. So that is not my point. My point is that the cryptocurrency, which comes out of the blockchain, as a result of all these activities of sealing and all that, that also is cryptographic because the currency is cryptographically or digital. It is a digital currency. Bitcoin is a digital currency. is one example of a blockchain currency. Ether is another one. It's not a currency, but it is turned into a currency. It's a coin. And then you have um, many, many types of coins. Thousands of uh, cryptocurrencies are there. They are called crypto because they cannot be, they cannot be manipulated. Their code cannot be tampered. So if you have a cryptocurrency of carrying such and such number, nobody can tamper it because it's, it's so difficult to tamper that because that number itself is very unique. So you, and it is a, in, and it is cryptographically protected. Therefore, there's no way by which you can tamper and decode it and take away the money from your wallet. Now, what is the problem with digital currency? Digital currency is not like a paper currency, right? Paper currency, yeah, who, holds a paper currency, nobody knows. I will be holding 100 rupees with me today. So today, and then I go to a shop and uh, exchange it for buying certain things. Then the shopkeeper keeps it. So it is anonymous to the holder. But uh, cryptocurrency is not like that. Cryptocurrency is anonymous to the holder, uh, but it is not protected by a number. Nobody else can get control of it unless the holder decides to give it. Now, 100 rupee note, if I take it on the way, somebody, some pickpocket takes it, it belongs to him. But that cannot easily happen because you have to hack the system to get it because it is cryptographically protected. So what happens is, uh, this is called a double spend problem. 
So I have a, a Bitcoin and I came out of some blockchain activity that I did. I'll explain that how it happens. Now I take the Bitcoin and so I go and buy, uh, Bitcoin is worth about 30 lakhs today, right? 30,000 $30, dollars today. So it is a huge amount of money. So I think, let me go and buy a, an apartment, right? I have two Bitcoins. So let me buy an apartment. Now it can so happen that I, in a paper currency situation, just imagine I am 60 lakh rupees as currency I'm having. In good old days, we used to have it. Now, now with digitization, that is not possible, right? You are tracked. Uh, because digital money can also always be tracked by authorities. But in paper currency, no, there's no tracking. That explains one of the reasons why demonetization was brought in. Now, the point is, if a digital currency is not cryptographically protected, it means that it can be spent, the same digital currency can be spent in one place. And I'll buy one apartment with 60 lakhs apartment. Then I'll buy another apartment somewhere else with 60 lakhs using the same Bitcoin. That's a problem with digital currency. If it doesn't have a cryptographic code, which is unique, it can be used many, many times to buy more with the same cryptocurrency. So to avoid that, cryptographic codes protect the digital money. So this is how the whole uh, system works. So what happened is the first generation of blockchains came in 2009. And uh, there is a reason for that because of the economic crisis in the world, 2008 economic crisis, people were fed up with banks in the United States because it is called the subprime crisis. So people thought that banks are very responsible, central banks are very responsible. So this, uh, this currency, uh, the bunch of computation specialists joined together. They assumed a name called Satoshi Nakamoto, sounds a Japanese programmer. Actually, we don't know whether that person, it is said, does not exist. It's a pseudonymous name. A group of people joined together, it is said. We don't know even whether it is true. It could be a single person or it could be a group of people. Whatever it is, they assume the name of Satoshi Nakamoto. And they created this, they wrote up a paper, white paper. White paper means an authentic paper on the idea of blockchain and cryptocurrencies. That is always available on the website. You just put Satoshi Nakamoto plus white paper, you will get it on the website. It's an open thing. So what I'm trying to say is, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto brought this uh, idea of digital uh, currency. Now, where did he say he said blockchain? So there will be a digital ledger. He's the one who has conceived all this. There is no he. We don't know whether it's a he or a she or a they. But the point is that digital ledger. Every time a digital ledger is uh, worked upon by miners. Mining means you are mining a blockchain. So mining means computation. You are solving. Uh, solving very tough algorithmic problems, algorithm related problems. So for that, it's a huge amount of work. You have to conceive of the code, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So what uh, the blockchain or originators, what they thought was, let us go ahead and uh, give a reward to people who successfully, uh, successfully create the blockchain, verify. I mean, mine the blockchain, which means program the blockchain, protect it cryptographically. No, not blockchain, block. Protect, the, protect it cryptographically and seal the block so that it is free from getting tampered. It's a huge amount of work. So as a reward, they said, you'll get Bitcoins. So Bitcoin is a reward for maintaining the digital ledger for, based on blockchains in a very faithful and a proper way. So, and you earn it only when people are verified that it is a solid ledger. You can't tamper with it. So all these verifiers, what they do is they'll try to break that system, that lock which they have created. And if they find it is not breaking, they'll say, okay, this is a solid block. Let it go and join the previous blocks in, into the chain. And as a result of a smart programmer who has done this, who has secured the block, secured all the transactions within the block, gets a reward, which is called Bitcoin. So, if the message was very clear. Unlike paper currency, where you keep on printing and issuing it, money has to be earned the hard way, and it is done through it. This was a philosophy. Now, this has not worked. This could have worked, but in, in that's a very great idea, very great dream, but it has not worked because most of the 
blockchain, I mean, bitcoins have turned into uh, speculative assets. Currency cannot become an asset. So if a currency is meant to be spent, but the currency becomes too valuable, supply is very limited, then people will hoard the currency. They will not spend. If they don't spend, the economy does not grow. So that is the tragedy with the, the cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. So whatever be the case, the point I'm saying is, unless you mine, you don't get the Bitcoin. Unless you sweat, there is a sweat on your bro, you don't get the Bitcoin. Now, this is how Bitcoins have been uh, conceived. This is how other types of coins are all the light coins are there. So many coins are there, which are meant to be currencies. But uh, these days, blockchains have changed after 2013, a new idea called smart contracts came and that has Ethereum. So Ethereum basically is called Ethereum. It's a blockchain of a particular type. It is a virtual machine on which you generate smart contracts. Smart contracts are nothing but digital contracts. Everything is digitized, like the block. So you don't, in good old days, if I want to enter into a rental agreement with my tenant uh, for my house, which I put on rent, I'll take a stamp paper and uh, write up a lot of things on the conditions of lease and all that. Then I'll get a notary, put it in a stamp paper, get a notary to certify it. I had to pay some money to the notary. And at the end of the day, when the tenant is about to leave my house, I find that the contract has been pre-written, overwritten, certain entries have gone, and there is bound to be disputes between the tenant and the landlord. Whereas in a smart contract, these things don't happen. Uh, the it is all digitized. It is put up in a blockchain. And the blockchain is for a lot of people to see. So a lot of witnesses are there who are seeing that this was entered by me and my uh, tenant. They'll say that, look, there, there is no scope for any dispute between you. Because we have seen that uh, because the, uh, the tenant, first of all, the agreement cannot be tampered. So that doesn't matter. Secondly, people are there to judge and therefore there's no need for any dispute. People will not go to the court if they find that if only a few people were witnesses, then there can be disputes. But if everybody is a lot of people are witnesses, that will not happen. So this smart contract is a simple example. Like that smart contracts are used for in public systems. If you put up uh, electricity company supplying electricity to your homes, it's a smart contract uh, covered by a smart contract. So it will say that so much kilowatts of uh, uh, electricity will be supplied every day without any interruption. And if there is an interruption, there can be a refund. That kind of things are enabled through a smart contract. So that is from another type of blockchain, which is called Ethereum. So Ethereum is now the thing. Uh, blockchain with it, Satoshi Nakamoto's Bitcoin blockchain, which generated Bitcoins, is almost gone. It is getting upgraded and all that. That's a separate issue. But this new blockchains are Ethereum. So smart contracts are proliferating. Infrastructure projects, banking sector, anything you name, everything is covered by a smart contract. And smart contracts, uh, blockchain also creates its own crypto coins. They are called Ethereum in the case of Ether. Now there are new blockchains with uh, which issue smart contracts like uh, Solana and all that. You know, they, they also have smart contracts. And they also have the currency. So every activity of a blockchain is monetized. And therefore, it has to have a currency or a token or a coin. So currency is means of payment. Token is just a, like a, you know, uh, token. How do I put it? It is supposed to be having a representative value. That it cannot be used for exchange, for coffee, tea, and etc. It was not meant to be that. So I tokenize all my services. So what I do is, now look at the way it is working. Ukraine, for instance, is now lodged in a, uh, I mean, they're fighting the Russian army, right? Now the go government of Ukraine, according to newspaper reports, they said that we, we, are, uh, we want crypto contributions, cryptocurrency contributions, but their economy is not doing well for quite some time. So lots of cryptocurrency money has flown into Ukraine. Now, uh, it is for, and government is asking for it. Though, so therefore, it is supposed to have landed up with the government accounts. So what government said is, we in, in turn, we'll issue tokens for you, people who have sent us the cryptocurrency. So what is a token? Token is like a bond, a digital bond. It is, it merely says that you have contributed 250 and we IOU, you know, we will return it as and when we get a chance. So this is the idea of a token. So this is all done through 
Ethereum blockchains. Earlier, the first generation of blockchain, which was Satoshi Nakamoto, did not have this idea of tokenization. So today, we are not talking of cryptocurrency to be the greatest contribution of blockchains. Today, we are talking about uh, blockchains as having contributed to improving economic transactions between parties. Now, other, there are many other applications. Uh, the other application is uh, uh, Ukraine, uh, Ukraine, not Ukraine, Georgia, which is again near Russia, right? They went for all their land records were put in, into a blockchain. So earlier, it was all stored in digital uh, conventional data servers. It was electronicized and stored. But Georgia said, no, land titles will be put in blockchain so that nobody can tap over it. So this was the other application which government departments are trying to do. So if you don't tamper, then I am very sure that the property that I have bought, I put it in a blockchain, nobody can tamper with it. So some uh, official cannot sit and say, oh, no, no, this does not belong to you. Look, I have somebody else has also produced a uh, ownership right, so, uh, an ownership uh, paper. So it can't be done if it is put in a blockchain. So countries have gone for it. India also... Uh, there are, uh, for instance, the Karnataka government is uh, had a very ambitious scheme, which is called Bhumi. Bhumi was supposed to be the land title production thing in rural areas, agricultural areas. It was supposed to be a revolution at that time because all everything was uh, uh, the data, all the land records were digitized, first generation digitized, not this present one and uh, stored in a giant data servers. But what happened to those servers? Uh, in one or two cases, it was hacked. As a result of it, some of the data were fudged and changed and all that. So Karnataka government is also moving towards blockchains in a very big way to secure land titles and all that. So this is the other uh, thing. These are the different uh, Ethereum, Binance, Coin. Every, every blockchain is associated with a coin. Some coins could be like Bitcoin a currency. Some could be a token. Uh, some could be a coin for a local uh, application of the blockchain. Some could be tokens like XRP is a token. Token is basically this is uh, by a company which is called Ripple. Ripple is supposed to be the replacement for uh, Swift. You know the Swift. Uh, uh, Swift is in news because of the Russian Ukraine whatever. Is a crisis. Swift is used by us for sending account to our friend abroad. It takes some time, but Swift has now improved thanks to the competition from blockchain. Ripple does it in a few seconds, and they have also a token which is called XRP. So it is impossible to talk of blockchains without having, without linking it to a currency or a token or a, a simple coin, right? Which is neither a currency nor a token. Because that is how it, the ledger concept works. Ledger goes with money. And therefore, every electronic new ledger which is dedicated and, and a new thing has to go with its own money. That which has nothing to do with Indian rupee or US dollars. That is how it has been done. The other thing is LOU. Now, you know that uh, the, uh, the diamond uh, import scam which happened. LOUs were opened uh, in favor of... Uh, this particular person uh, for one year. Actually, it was only meant to be there for 90 days, but somehow they opened, RBI guidelines were violated. So what has happened is uh, the entire LOU was opened by the Punjab National Bank, and then the details were conveyed to uh, Bank of Baroda and uh, Allahabad Bank and Axis Bank, which had operations in Rotterdam, from which this gentleman wanted to get some uh, line of credit. So this Punjab National Bank said, yes, we agree in case he is not able to repay it, we'll pay it. That is called an LOU. But the real scandal happened because uh, this person had a bank account in Punjab National Bank, but he wanted much more money than that. And an LOU, which was for many, many times more than what he had as an account. And what they did was the, the swift web message was tampered. So first time it went, it went through the core banking system. And uh, then the SWIFT message went saying that this is the LOU, we have agreed. SWIFT is a messaging, messaging system as well. Second time what happened was somebody in the, in the bank is supposed to have, inquiry is still going on, I cannot comment on it, but is supposed to have tampered 
that is saying it is not 30,000 that we have issued LOU, we have issued it for 300,000, right? I'm, I'm just giving rough numbers. These numbers have nothing to do with the actual case. So that was done by tampering the Swift uh, web message system. If you had put it in a blockchain, there's no question of tampering. It would have been in the blockchain. They could have seen what is happening. It has to be verified and confirmed by people. So what did they do? They avoided the core banking system and directly went into it. But if a blockchain comes, this first of all, tampering is not possible. Every message will have to go through the core banking system because otherwise the blockchain will not accept that as a verified transaction. So this is another big advantage to avoid. So what is the advantage finally of the blockchain? You can Every minute you can understand what is happening to your liquidity position, what is happening to your current asset position, current liability position. You can say uh, blockchains are used in supply chains. Shipping companies like Maersk are using it for supply chains so that uh, through smart contracts, so that when there is some shipping happening from one country to the other, uh, supposing I am exporting spices from India, a pepper from India to Rotterdam in Europe, uh, typically what's happening is the by the time the spice reaches uh, the shipping company, I, I will ship it. So once it reaches there, at the port, they will do some checks and find that the moisture content is 20%. Now 20% because of high moisture, what happens is if the pepper is a hygroscopic product, it absorbs moisture. So if that moisture gets absorbed, then you will develop fungus on that. So what happens is uh, all the pepper used to be rejected at the port. And then the uh, contractor, the exporter, that is me, will say that no, when I exported it, it was only 10%. So whatever has happened is because the shipping company allowed a lot of condensation to happen within the containers. And therefore the onus is on the shipping company, but there was no way of proving it. With blockchain, the 10% uh, moisture is put as a smart contract it is put in the blockchain. It is verified by people that yes, it is 10%, then the shipping happens. Then if it enters at the Rotterdam port and they find it is 15%, they can easily say that, well, the shipping company created the problem. So this is how one case of how blockchains help supply chains to be more orderly. And therefore shipping companies will be careful because they know that they will be exposed. So the supply chains become more efficient. And as a result of it, as an exporter from a developing country, I find that I'm not incurring losses, mainly because of blockchains coming into the picture. So like this, there are many things. Uh, you have your customers, their problems. Customers have uh, given a feedback and it is saying that the product has these defects. It will be hidden. But if it is put in a blockchain, the entry is put in a blockchain, that this product has such a defect, then Customers uh, can always enforce a claim. We had made an entry, it has gone to the blockchain. Please check up the register. So like this, you know, you can uh, liquidity position of the company, working capital needs, all these things get uh, much more and banks also. Now look at this, working capital, what's the problem? Working capital is one of the biggest problems with SMEs and startups. Now, in realize uh, you, all of you, all of you know, in as accountants, that receivable problem is one of the biggest problems facing SMEs. But if you have a blockchain entry which is authentic and which says that so much of accounts have to come from such and such plan, banks find it easier to give you uh, bridge loans or working capital loans. So this is how blockchains create a better system for. Uh, so on this note, I will I have explained what it is, but the problem with the blockchain is, now I'll come to the defects. The defect is that a blockchain is anonymous. As I told you, my identity and the receiver's identity is not known. All that is known is this wallet number is authentic. Is it a fake number that has been quoted or is it a, uh, the other receivers is authentic. Once they find it is authentic, they say, okay, the transaction appears to be genuine. But here it is not, but the problem is because of personal anonymity, the public key is known, that's called public key. The wallet ID is protected through a public key. But uh, the private key, my individuality, that's called a, like a password for me. A private key means they use the word key, but it's actually a password. That is not known, therefore my identity is not established. 
Therefore, as a result of which, I can indulge in any kinds of illegal transfers, money laundering, uh, dark web activities. I can do any of these things, right? So that is one of the defects of it. Uh, the second, and that's why the banks are worried, government is worried, uh, and so, yeah, so that is why they have a problem with cryptocurrency. But these things can be actually handled in a much better way if there is a sound policy system in place. So that's not a very big issue, but still those problems are there. So how do you handle these problems? So you have to handle the problems by uh, creating uh, regulations which are friendly to the technology, which also provide some scope for coins to exist and uh, you know, multiply because coins are required for monetization and at the same time does not threaten the official currency of the country. So this is what they have to look at. So the Niti Aayog has now, the Department of Ministry of Electronics and Government of India has come out with a very ambitious blockchain uh, policy, which is very progressive, very good, and says that, you know, we'll avoid all the negative effects and we'll try to optimize it. And then the focus is entirely on the customer who is supposed to benefit from the blockchain. Now, governments, a lot of, I'm sure Orisa government is also very, very much involved in this blockchain technology thing. The Telangana is very advanced. Kerala is advanced. Karnataka is advanced. So a lot of work is happening, but mostly in the realm of uh, companies are doing it. Now, those blockchains are not what Satyoshi Nakamoto did. Everybody will watch. It doesn't. It is a restricted blockchain called permissive blockchain. So within the company, a few people will handle it. Earlier, only one fellow was handling it. Therefore, there could be abuses. Now a few people are happy. So that is how the systems are working. With that, I open it to the questions. I have finished. Thank you, sir, for a wonderful learning session. Um, that was, yeah, actually, is the concept of uh, nicely deliver on concept of blockchain and its uh, benefits and also its the negative effects. Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir. Now the uh, forum is open for question and answer session. If any question or any queries, the participant <coughs> either may put the chat box or may directly on mute no, no, no. and directly ask the question. No, no. So yeah. anyone can no uh, sir, one question is how the Bitcoin is traded like stock market transaction? Hmm. <coughs> What's the question? How the Bitcoin, Bitcoin. Bitcoin, Bitcoin is traded like stock market transaction? Yeah, See, the point is Bitcoin was not meant to be in the classical sense traded. It was like money in your pocket, right? But it became a limit. It was always programmed to be limited in supply. So when it is like gold, in good old days, gold coins were used, isn't it? In 1900s and all that. Why did they abandon gold? Because it was supply is limited for gold in the world. So gold became so valuable that people don't want to spend money, right? So the money became an asset. What is an asset? You know it. What is an asset? An asset and liability. An asset means something which brings you returns. Yes. So money is not, the currency is not supposed to bring you returns. But if the currency becomes so valuable, people will hold it. And once it becomes hoarded, it ceases to be money or currency, not money, currency, and becomes an asset. So once it becomes an asset, it gets traded as an exchange in the, the Bitcoin exchanges, the, in cryptocurrency exchanges as an asset. So a lot of money, crypto money is getting tr transacted as assets. So stocks are also assets. Therefore, it is traded. 
So this was not what was the intention of the programmers when they set it up. But that is a reality. That is one of the sad realities of blockchains. So actually, till now, the cryptocurrency is not legalized. Huh? A cryptocurrency. No, it is not legalized. It is not legalized. It is not illegalized also. Yes. <laughs> So something which is uh, not legalized does not automatically become illegal. But at the same mm -hmm. time, something which is uh, just because it is not illegalized, it doesn't become legal also. Right? So government, of course, uh, thinks thinking. that uh, no, it is not it is not legalized. Let us be very clear about it. cryptocurrency cannot be legalized. How can it be legalized unless? Indian rupee says that, okay, apart from Indian rupee, you can also use cryptocurrency. No government will agree. So, and secondly, even for other, uh, even for other purposes, it is not uh, legalized. I mean, it is absolutely not legalized. Now, I get another question, uh, Mr. R.K. Mukherjee, what, what is, well, no, I saw another question. Taxation angle. Well, the taxation angle is very simple. The government, as uh, the finance minister had announced in the union budget, it said digital assets should be recognized for taxation. That doesn't mean it is legalized. Understand? So, from a taxation angle, they see it, uh, they treat it as a digital asset. And depending upon the type of uh, uh, digital asset, for instance, NFTs, non fungible tokens, they are like a they are like a special form of asset. It is a capital gain, right? It is like a capital gains item. It is like selling your house and making money. So uh, it doesn't happen like a Bitcoin traded every minute. It's not traded. It is one item which is put on an auction. Money comes. So you created uh, it for five rupees. It sells for five lakh. So obviously it will come under capital gains. Some people they, in the United States, they say, no, no, it is Bitcoins and other cryptocurrencies can, yeah, are commodities. Therefore, it should be subjected to commodity taxation. But it could be, it could be. I'm not trying to say because they are standardized and they're like commodities. So what is the tax on commodities? That should apply to them. So taxation on derivatives, it's like a capital gain. It can be treated as a capital gain from direct taxes or it can also be treated as a commodity tax on a GST. All these are possibilities, but it is still evolving. Next question is who issues and controls the cryptocurrency? Well, it is a community, abstract community. It has nothing to do with government. It is a community of members who have been miners, who have performed the activities connected to it. It is a global membership. It has nothing to do with any country, right? Mm -hmm. Now, there are a bunch of programmers, there are a bunch of verifiers. Who issues and controls the cryptocurrency? They issue and control the cryptocurrency. Then, uh, yeah, Mr. Govindraju, what is your question? So Good evening, sir. Yeah. Uh, sir, my question was, in a popular belief, people say there is no underlying asset for yes. crypto. Yes. And it is yes. very dangerous for certain very, kind very of economies. But you know something? There is, which is, uh, is there any underlying currency for underlying asset for any paper currency in the world? No. Right? There is not. But there is one thing, government is there to say that if there is a problem, you come to us, we'll help you. In cryptocurrency, unfortunately, that is your risk. If there is nothing underlying, but you know, in a deeper sense, cryptocurrency's underlying is a blockchain technology. Right? It is protected by the blockchain technology, but blockchain technology is not unfortunately monetized. Okay, sir. So sir, people will, ultimately, people will say cryptocurrency has uh, sits on thin ice. Sir, my question is hmm. whether uh, the cryptocurrency can replace the paper currency? No, cryptocurrency can replace the paper currency if the government agrees to that. Now there are uh, there are some countries which have done the El Salvador. What is Bolivia. the limitation? Huh? What is the limitation no. of using the limitation cryptocurrency? The government has to declare it as legal tender under the Currency Act, payment under the Payment of Settlement Act, which no government will give. So if it is not legalized, then how it is being adopted? 
it is being adopted because it is not illegalized also so it will not be adopted by uh, for payment purposes but it will be adopted for uh, as an asset for investments and other things and sure, there like, will be a community of people who will exchange it nahi right? but but, uh, but a country like india nobody they, they, the people are not conversant with this uh, yes, cryptocurrency so, no so, but you tell, shall i tell you one thing there will be a lot of in convenience in that country correct correct i agree with you so people the, like india people most of the people in india they are not acquainted with this system correct correct so But you know something no i am not completed you allow so, me to so, speak. So. you allow me to speak vishwanath vishwanath mr vishwanath yes sir yes sir now what was he saying a illiterate yes i i would struggle with bitcoin but you know 100 million people are there who have brought bitcoins i am not one of them but there are 100 million people who have brought bitcoins they have have a sound understanding on how to make money <laughs> so from that but most of them would like to avoid taxes which is uh, which is exactly what is the problem then what else sir can i may yeah. i sir yes sir uh, after covid the hmm. the cryptos got very matlab ha huh? it it became like it skyrocketed rocketed yes because after covid there's a simple reason for that it happened not just in not in india globally now you want to know why hello I yes sir yes sir yeah it is simple covid meant stimulus what is stimulus government started spending money to revive the economies isn't it so fiscal deficit became very big or it could be through monetary expansion so today america is facing the highest inflation ever after they have recovered from covid why because covid stimulus went into depreciating the uh de- depreciating the currency so when it is anticipated that fiscal expansion or monetary expansion happens we, what is the result of it the result of it is that the currency of the country will come down will depreciate so if the currency depreciates then obviously where will people go to look for alternatives they have to go to bitcoin because bitcoin's value will go up got it so whenever you have an inflation like situation bitcoins will go up initially when covid happened government spent money to get the economy off track but after some uh, during covid time because of supply inelasticity and supply problem we didn't realize but the moment covid started going away we suddenly found uh, things happening prices have gone up now this is much before ukraine crisis prices went up so when prices went up your currency value comes down so obviously people look for bitcoins and cryptocurrencies as an alternative and as a method of saving so its value goes up thank you sir for nice interactive session now i would like to request cma sudhendran tripathi secretary of the chapter uh please give the formal vote of thanks before thank you shakti sir good evening to each of the intellectual assembled today on the eve of the webnet on blockchain the new technology of trust and future prospects eminent resource person on today's occasion dr a damadaran professor in economics and social science indian institute of management bangalore our chairman cm himuj misra sir chairman pd committee and past chairman of the chapter cma sakdar singh sir esteemed cma members central council members regional council members past chairman and invitee and guest i cma sujanan tripathi secretary of the chapter feel honored to extend formal vote of thanks i on behalf of the management committee and the entire cm fraternity of bhuvaneswar chapter extend an earnest thank and deep gratitude to our resource person dr a damodaran for acceptance of our invitation and enlightening us 
blockchain the new technology of trust and future prospects thank you sir for sharing your valuable input among us thank you so much also, thank you thank you sir i would also like to convey my special thanks to our beloved chairman cma himoz misra and chairman pd committee cma satyendra singh sir for arranging the web meet i convey my joyful thanks to all the participant for their continued support and cooperation and nicely interactions last but not the least i am very much happy to express vote of thanks to all the professional colleagues in the management committee and staff of the chapter for their effort and support thank you all for your cordial cooperation acknowledge all of your support with this i hereby declare the closure of the pray before our almighty for all your good health stay safe stay healthy good night jai jagannath namaskar thank you sir 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 it is a nice interaction sir